My name is Davis Peterson, MD, Anchorage Fractional Orthopedic Clinic Spinal Surgery, and I'll be talking about spinal segmental instability. Segmental instability refers to a malalignment of the vertebral bodies and the discs that's usually associated with degenerative conditions, although it can occur congenitally, it can result be the result of trauma, uh, and it generally indicates a malalignment or an instability between segments that uh, can result in impingement of nerve roots and can produce chronic pain. Spinal instability can develop as an acquired lesion from degeneration and wear and tear on the facet joints or the disc degeneration with uh, loss of height and then slippage anteriorly and posteriorly. It can also occur as a congenital or early developmental lesion in which the bridge of bone between the facets is not completely formed, resulting in a translational instability of the spine. This can occur traumatically with divers or professional football players or high intensity sports with hyperextension where the leverage of the spine can cause a fracture to occur that sometimes will not heal. Uh, this can occur similarly in the cervical spine, but more typically in the neck, it's either traumatic from an acute injury or it occurs as a result of degeneration. Typically the slippage is forward in the sagittal plane, but can occur laterally as well, or even in a rotational plane. Symptoms of spinal instability in the case of trauma often are the result of nerve injuries or spinal cord injuries, which can be basically numbness, weakness, paralysis, uh, loss of coordination, etc. But typically in the degenerative cases, more people present with low back pain or sometimes neck pain, and they'll often feel a clunking or shifting sensation when they roll over in bed or when they change positions from lying down to standing. And typically gravity accentuates the deformity, whereas lying down will often allow the spine to, to some degree, realign. Segmental instability, uh, once suspected, is diagnosed usually on dynamic x-rays. Standing flexion extension films where patient flexes forward and then extends will often show translational changes, both in the neck and the lumbar spine. Uh, it also is uh, useful to do supine x-rays or even an MRI to measure the spine alignment in the supine position with gravity neutralized. Very often these, uh, these instabilities will reduce fully, but occasionally, even in, in this situation, you can see a a segmental translation either in lateral or sagittal plane. Translational instability can be managed uh, conservatively initially in, mi in milder cases with anti-inflammatory, sometimes physical therapy with trunk and back stabilization exercises. In more advanced cases, particularly in the lumbar spine where anterolisthesis or forward slippage is more than four and a half millimeters, and especially with root, or root nerve root impingement or neurological uh, accompaniments, sometimes sta stabilization procedures are indicated with a combination of screws, rods, bone graft, sometimes even inner body or anterior stabilization cages are required. In the cervical spine, similar uh, surgical procedures can be necessary, especially when the spinal cord needs to be protected. For patients who have undergone spinal stabilization surgery with screws, rods, or any other type of instrumentation, the recovery is based partially on the number of levels that need to be stabilized and the extent of pathology before. Greater levels of instrumentation required, there's a longer healing time and mobilization is somewhat slower. It also is determined to some degree on the pre-existing neurological deficits. If they're severe, rehabilitation may be required for an extended period postoperatively to get people independent. In more mild nerve compression cases or when individuals are very fit and strong to begin with, uh, recovery is much more rapid. To learn more about segmental instability, please visit our website at afoc.com. Thank you.